This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Just a few days before Christmas, 2022. Are you a buy and hold investor? Have you believed in the system? Do you still believe in the system? Now, of course, they might turn it around and they might go back to QE infinity and they might figure out a way to levitate risk assets to the moon again. How much do you want to bet on that? Is that really where you want to play ball? Or if you're a rational person who thinks that tail risk is still a thing, it's kind of time for trend following, isn't it? Just a few quick links that you should check out if you have not seen across my world. Trendfollowing.com slash FAQs. Trendfollowing.com slash resources. Some great free insights that will bring you into the trend following mindset right away. And for those of you that did not take advantage of my professional offer, my professional course and system offer, as we close out 2022, I do have a special on my longstanding flagship product. If you'd like to take advantage of that, drop me an email. I'm easy to reach, michael at covell.com, C-O-V-E-L.com. And as we head into this Christmas weekend, Let me give you a little best of, a little motivational best of, a little good thinking best of. I hope you enjoy one of my favorite episodes of all time, because if you can figure out a way to think like this guy thought while he was alive, and yes, he unfortunately has passed on, but if you can figure out a way to go his direction, to understand what he understood, and it's timeless. His mindset is timeless. His lessons are timeless. But if you can follow his wisdom, you're going to have a great life. That much, I promise. Without any further delay, except to remind you, if you want the flagship offer, the special, in the last few days of 2022, drop me an email, michael at covell.com. And without any further delay, let's jump right into a little best of for Christmas. My guest today is the world's reigning expert on expertise. And he has a powerful new approach to mastering almost any skill. His book, his new book, Peak, Secrets from the New Science of Expertise, My guest today is Anders Ericsson. You've probably seen these talent books over the years, whether it's a book from Malcolm Gladwell or the talent books, Talent is Overrated, The Talent Code. All of these gentlemen, fine pieces of work, but all of these gentlemen, their influences, their foundations were all based on Anders Ericsson's work in the field of deliberate practice want to learn a language, pick up an instrument, but you're daunted. You want to master chess. You want to improve your ability in a certain sport. Anders new work peak condenses three decades of his original research to introduce an incredibly powerful approach to learning. It's fundamentally different from the way that we grow up learning. I feel very lucky to have this guest on my show. And his work was influencing me way back when I was doing the turtle book. He was laying the foundation, the academic foundation for why the turtles were successful. I talk about deliberate practice in the complete turtle trader. So Anders Ericsson has had a long influence on my work too. I hope you enjoyed this great conversation with Anders Ericsson.
let me jump in with my first observation. And this is just kind of a, a big picture idea to uh, get the audience uh, into the direction where we're going to go. But I don't know if you saw the news the other day. And of course, you follow a lot of sports figures. But uh, Stephen Curry is probably the best basketball player in the NBA today. He's not a very big guy. So not huge physical attributes or anything. But he has hit three pointers like they're going out of style. And the other day, he just, you know, just rocketed up. I think he hit 12 in one game, which was an NBA record. And I, I posted something on my Facebook. I said, wow, this, and I just finished reading Peak. And I said, this is all a result of deliberate practice. And immediately somebody jumped in and said, oh no, he was born with it. His father played in the NBA. It's the genes. And I thought to myself, I wonder what the professor would say. <laughs> I, I, I think we know of uh, a number of father and sons uh, that were successful in sports. And I guess it kind of raises the issue here of, you know, why does that happen? And and I think there are basically, you know, two sort of extreme accounts. One would be, you know, that you're born with the genes that allow you to do it. Uh, The other one is that you're basically born to a father who very early on helps you basically guide your practice in such a way that once you reach adolescence and adulthood, you've now had this practice history that can explain now your superior performance. You've spent your adult life, and you say this clearly, studying the secrets of extraordinary performers. I mean, this has been your passion. Why don't you go back in time and let the audience start to understand how this became your passion? What were the triggering moments early in your life? If there was a probably more than one triggering moment, but if there's if there's any particular moment where you really would have started to have for yourself the aha moment of like, wow, I really want to go down this this practice route, this deliberate practice route. Where, where did that start for you? I, I think I would go back to uh, pretty almost high school where. I guess I was, and, and I think a lot of people are interested in trying to understand how they can get better. I was interested in reading biographies and, and, and look at people who I really admired. And I guess uh, as I started my doctoral work, I, I kind of wanted to understand the thinking, you know, to, to kind of find a method that could tap into what the experts were thinking when they, you know, were exhibiting this superior behavior. And I think that was kind of the key step here, because at that time, there wasn't really all that much work. People were very skeptical as to whether people actually could report anything you know, relevant that could explain sort of their superior performance. What I found was that when I studied task after task, people were reporting information that really helped to understand how they were able to you know, achieve a higher than average performance. Now, the next step, I guess, was when I was invited to go and work with Herb Simon, who later got the Nobel Prize when I was a postdoc in his lab. The reason why I came to him was to really kind of put the uh, ways that people express their thinking when they're engaging in activities within a theoretical framework that would help us sort of relate that information to models that could regenerate superior performance on various tasks, ranging from chess to mental multiplication and other kinds of activities. And then I kind of started working with one of the senior professors at Carnegie Mellon University, where Herb Simon uh, was, was at the time. And we were interested in is it possible for people to change sort of your capacity? And at that time, people thought that your short-term memory, how much you could think about at a given time, was really capacity that couldn't really be changed. And one way to study individual differences in that capacity was to read people series of numbers and see how many numbers would they be able to repeat back perfectly. What they found was, you know, was around seven, which is, I guess, a phone number, pretty much. That's it. Just se- just seven at that time. Well, th- that was sort of the average performance. If you put somebody into uh, a lab situation and read them a series of digits, 
they were basically able to get seven numbers 50% of the time. So that was kind of their limit. You know, they would be even better if you only read them six digits, and they would be virtually perfect if you only read them five. But basically, the number of digits that you could hold on to and report back exactly in order uh, was on the average seven. And, and I guess there's a famous paper that says seven plus minus two. So basically <laughs> something between five and nine kind of captured what uh, average people could do. We then started to ask the question, if you give people practice on that particular task, can they actually improve performance? What we found was we found a volunteer, and that volunteer, after about 40 hours, was able to do over 20 digits. So basically, by now collecting verbal reports on what changes in his thinking processes were developing along with this increased ability to do this task, we got a better understanding here on how people could improve their memory in this particular task. And with even more training, he got it so he could actually recall sequences up to 80 digits. And we trained his, basically a friend of his, and, and he was able to get over 100. And, and we'd studied some people now recently in China who at the time had the world record, and they're able to do over 300 digits. At this time, were you starting to, was the the insights as to how to break through those thresholds, were you, those were starting to piece together for you and your team and, and your associates at that time? Yeah, and, and I think that was kind of a key insight that came actually a, a couple of years later when people were starting to ask me, you know, I mean, who cares if you can remember digits? So, okay, you've shown here that this performance, which seems incredible, is trainable, because obviously when you train an individual, the same genes, you know, the person's genes and the DNA doesn't change just because you give them training. I mean, it's obviously the same in the beginning of training as in the end of training. The key question then was, and, and, and the way I started to think now was focused on if you can train that particular performance and that particular task, can you actually use training to improve performance, not generally, but basically improve it on other tasks like planning when you're making test moves or when you're making medical diagnoses. And I think that was kind of the key insight that if you could train one specific task, and that was consistent with what we found even in the memory for digits case, because if we tested this guy who could do 80 digits, he could only do about six consonants. So it was a very domain-specific skill, so he actually was able to improve his performance and his memory capacity, but it was limited now to particular type of material and a little bit to the kind of characteristics of the task uh, more generally. But if you apply this generally now and ask, if you give somebody else a different task, can you actually design training such that this individual will be able to break through sort of the performance that they, you know, currently have? Now, the practice, at least if we stay with the, the, the numbers memorization example, the practice, this was not just, and to use some of your terminology, this was not just naive practice. This was very purposeful practice. You might want to take the audience down the path as we start to break this apart, uh, thinking of what purposeful practice is compared to what maybe many of us novices might think of as practice. One of the keys, uh, if you're going to practice, is that you get immediate feedback on your performance. And I think that is one thing that when people are, especially in professional context, you often have to wait to know whether you were right. So a doctor diagnosing a patient, they obviously will try to do the best they can, but they really don't get feedback on whether they were accurate or not until much later and sometimes never. In this kind of memory task, we could tell them immediately once they tried to recall the digits, whether he made any mistakes. So that actually gave this feedback loop. So he could actually, you know, think about what he was 
generating, and he kind of formed meaningful associations primarily to running times to group them into, you know, three uh, digits that would be sort of a mile time. So four minutes and 32 seconds would be, you know, a very good mile time for uh, basically an amateur uh, athlete. He was then able to kind of realize when he made mistakes how he could then try to experiment and come up with new types of ways of encoding the digits that allowed him then to progress and be able to remember longer and longer sequences of digits. And to jump to another example, which I just find fascinating, and I'm sure the audience will, and you can take as much time as you'd like to give as much color as you like, but and having having once lived in London and witnessed and observed the streets set up in London and how the taxis worked, and I walked those streets like crazy back in the mid-1990s, but taxi drivers in London are a special breed, and they have to go through intense training, and they have to learn a lot about London streets. And that learning, and this is this is just so... This is why this book peak that you've put together with your co-author is fantastic. That learning, the learning of the streets by the taxi drivers in London, this this changes the brain physically. I mean, this, there's an there's an altering of the brain. I, why don't you start from the beginning with your with your your London taxi driver uh, story? I, it's just it's just incredibly fascinating. I, I think the taxi driver story is particularly interesting because here we're talking about people cab drivers who aren't really special in any way, and, and in fact, they've tested their cognitive abilities and found that they're pretty much normal people. But given that they have, in order to sort of pass this test that allows them to be uh, cab drivers, they will be tested on, on given arbitrary kind of starting points and end points, and then they have to, from memory, uh, kind of report what would be the most efficient path to take a passenger between those uh, destinations. And, and and this is something that they've done now well before we had GPS and all this electronic help. And it ended up taking actually, you know, many years of training for these people to pass this qualifying test. And essentially what, what you found was that the end time that kind of learn some, you know, over 10,000 streets and all their kind of interconnections. And when basically uh, McGuire in, in England tested, so they, she scanned their brains, you found that actually these individuals who had achieved the uh, mastered uh, the, the map, actually their brains had changed. Way of understanding here how Increased memory can actually influence uh, the, the the basic of the structure of the brain, and, and and there's now plenty of other examples. But her study was so interesting because she actually analyzed and, and compared now cab drivers to bus drivers who are driving just as much, and in a sense have just as much experience, and found now that the bus drivers did not exhibit this these brain changes that were associated now with mastering the map of, of the London streets. One of the more interesting and cool aha moments that I think any of us learned people that want to learn about how things really work, it's just one of those great moments where you're like, wow. And I think it gets even more interesting is that this this comes, this the, the learning of the streets by these taxi drivers in London. This is all about, as you will describe in our conversation today, deliberate practice. But, and correct me if I'm wrong, if one stops being a taxi driver, if one ceases to do this particular skill for, let's say, a decade, will you see a regression in the brain changes? Will the brain changes uh, revert to the mean, so to speak? We, we see that in a number of domains, that maintaining the practice is really key for maintaining high levels of performance. And I think a lot of people will recognize that when they stop exercising, you know, their performance after a couple of years reverts back to the normal level. 
And that seems to be a key in, in all the skills that we've looked at, that without practice, you basically revert back to where you started if you wait long enough. There's, a, there's some great examples in your work uh, beyond even the, the book that we're talking about today. For many skeptics out there, though, I think they might they might look at some of these, uh, quote, child prodigies, and they might try to draw inferences and conclusions. I can think of two in particular that you discuss in your book, and I'm going to let you choose which one you might want to exemplify in our conversation. Mozart, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, fantastic example. Everyone uh, knows some general understanding of uh, the brilliance of this very small child at a young age. And also somebody who's been on my podcast before, uh, I think she was the first female chess grandmaster and her sister, I think, is the current one, which would be Susan Polgar has appeared on my podcast. I don't know if you, if you might want to elaborate for the audience out there that wants to say, uh, but Professor uh, Mozart, he was a, a child prodigy, he was born with it. Uh, you know, Susan Polgar, you know, or all of her sisters, they're all chess brilliance. Uh, this, what does practice have to do with this? Pick one of those examples and run with it, Professor. Let's take Mozart, because I think he would be the one that most people be fam familiar with. And I guess what we're saying is, you need to look at Mozart's upbringing. And, and one of the things that people don't recognize is that Mozart's father was a famous musician. And, and, and when Mozart came along, I guess he had some ideas about the possibility here of training young children. So he's actually the first person to actually write music training for basically younger uh, children. So he invested pretty much his, uh, his life trying now to both train his older sister, uh, but primarily Mozart in terms of providing him early with training. And what we say uh, in the book is that some of the characteristics that Mozart exhibited, like, for example, his really remarkable ability to listen at a tone and be able to say which key on the piano produced that particular tone. More recent research have shown that that is an ability that virtually uh, that, that any child seems to be able to attain if you give them the training, but it has to be training quite early, similar to Mozart starting to play when he was three or four years old. You have to actually start the music training that early, and then the brain seems to be receptive to learning those kinds of distinctions, and you can then basically as an adult preserve those abilities, but it's very difficult or almost impossible for an adult to achieve those kinds of abilities if you start practicing at an older age. You're a data guy. You're a research guy. So people out there that are listening, they might be thinking, well, I don't want my child to have such intense, deliberate practice at a young age. And you're not necessarily, you're not making a value judgment here. You're just saying the data shows us that peak performers, that there is something to be said for this early start in childhood. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, and I think I would like to uh, just clarify. I think it's very important if you want to produce a healthy, happy adult that you actually, you know, make sure that the training is consistent with what the child wants to do, so you're actually providing the child with opportunities for training. And I think this is, and I've had some contact here with Laszlo Polgar, who is the father of the three Polgar daughters who were so successful in chess. And that's kind of a really key idea of his, is that you actually have to put the child in charge, and you're actually helping the child to master whatever the activity is that you select. I guess there's all sorts of skills that if you want to become sort of a regular professional, that a parent can help the children acquire in sort of a motivating, basically very supportive environment. Speak to brain plasticity. I think sometimes we even though we're already in this conversation breaking open the idea that 
nurture can win out and that we all have this ability as you speak to. It's not necessarily what you're particularly born with. It's we're born with the ability to go about and practice to get better. But why don't you speak to the plasticity notion? Because I think we really do get caught up in the idea of this fixed, uh, that we're fixed. But in terms of being able to change, even if we go beyond uh, the discussion of uh, elite performers, our brain plasticity, this is something where average people that might want to start to master something later in life, we're not fixed in stone. We're not etched in stone, are we? No. And, and I think one key that I found very helpful when I talk to people, adults who want to acquire skills, is to realize that the younger sort of prodigies, often they might spend, you know, half an hour or something like that where you're really training them with a very explicit goal so they have to be 100% concentrated. But basically, if you push children to do a lot more than that until they're ready to increase their uh, time of training, they're actually going to sort of feel that it's aversive and not be willing to do it. And when it comes to adults, you know, they, if you want to run a marathon, I've seen, heard people, you know, who go out the first time and run for maybe 45 minutes, and then they're so sore that they never do it again. So basically that idea that if you're going to change the body, it's going to take gradual change. So you need to stimulate and push for change, but you can't basically go so far that you're actually harming the body and, and maybe pushing your motivation to a point where you no longer want to pursue it. And in terms of making these achievements, you know, improving ourselves, we are constantly up against homeostasis. We are constantly up against that we, we don't really want to break through those boundaries and breaking through the boundaries is part of deliberate practice. Yeah, and, and I guess I would say that if you're not trying to change something, you're probably not doing deliberate practice. So the key idea of deliberate practice is that you're trying to do something that you can't do well. And basically by figuring out ways that you can do this better, you will now basically raise your performance to a level that you didn't have before. There's some great examples, and I think chess becomes a, a fantastic example. And one aspect of of uh, deliberate practice, so part of the understanding is is chunking, or even uh, the phrase, uh, you know, a, a mental representation. And I think we could we could imagine. I'm going to let you explain this, but if we're watching a chess game, that the best chess players. It's not about just looking at all the individual pieces on the boards. They're thinking in patterns. They've developed and they've pushed themselves over so much time that their ability as a chess grandmaster to analyze is based on pattern recognition. Why don't you speak to the notion of chunking the mental representation and using chess as an example? I often try to basically take language. So if you're looking at basically a paragraph in English, you know, people will read it and it will make sense. And if it describes some physical situation or interaction, people can actually form an image, a picture in their head of that interaction. And I would argue that the chess board is a little bit the same for a skilled chess player. They can actually see the structure and, and now see what it is that are the weak spots and, and basically where, you know, likely sort of attacks uh, would be successful. By having chess masters think out loud when they're seeing a position and asked to pick the best move, we can actually see what are the features that they notice. And the way that they kind of probe the position is to make a move in their mind and then think up what the opponent's counter move would be and then keep doing that maybe for four or five times or even more in order to kind of diagnose what would happen if they make uh, a particular starting move. And I think understanding that that's really what's going on in the chess player's head really raises the question, how did they get to be able to do this type of thinking 
And I think that gets to the core of what we've been studying here. You know, how do you actually build up these mental representations that allow you to think through issues in your head uh, and basically then be able to kind of uh, decide on what is the best action in a given situation. We sometimes hear these examples of a, a chess player, a master, a grandmaster playing against uh, 25 people at the same time or something, something, maybe even blindfolded. And it sounds so impressive. But what's really interesting about your work and what you've uncovered is that the chess, once you get to that level where you have put in the time to develop those mental representations in chess, that you're now, let's say, at grandmaster level, that in some ways, it's not its not really a, I don't know if this is the right phraseology, but it's not necessarily difficult for those particular players now at that level with that amount of practice. It's not particularly difficult for them to then play 25 people at the same time blindfolded. It's not like they're going down a whole new path. It's literally just kind of a, a parallel skill that comes along with having already got to grandmaster level. Am I, am I describing that all correctly? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think... You know, what, what most people find difficult to understand is how you can play blindfolded. So, you know, you basically have to make the, the chess position in your head and actually just think about it. You can't basically look at any kind of perceptual configuration. And that seems to be a skill that people don't practice. It sort of comes about from once you plan now you can see the chessboard, but you actually have to make the moves in your head. And eventually, as you've been training that and been planning very deeply, you now have acquired the kind of skills that allow you, you know, just to more or less do it without the chessboard. You can do it completely mentally. And when you want to play several games, well, then basically you're just kind of doing that and, and what I've heard here chess players do is that they try to pick different kinds of games, not to kind of confuse one chess game with the other. And, and, and there's a lot of m maybe minor skills here that people actually acquire in order to be able to play multiple games. It's essentially the, the, the amazing thing is this building up of that mental representation that allows you to kind of, in your own mind, do things that people really need to have to do perceptually seeing uh, the chess pieces uh, on the board. And to build on these ideas further, I want to go back to an example that I brought up early on, the uh, the NBA basketball player, Stephen Curry, and he's got in, he won the MVP last year, but he's better this year. And there's, when you get to this level of this very high achievement it doesn't just stop. Some of these achievers, they just keep compounding on, you know, it's the it's the, the one level of achievement allows you to get to the next level and you can't skip steps, can you? We certainly don't have, have any evidence, you know, that there's any sort of magical improvements. But basically, if you understand how what the individual has been doing up to a given point, you can actually see the improvements because... That seems to be the things that they're working on to kind of keep improving. But I think that's a hallmark of an expert being able, you know, to kind of monitor what they're doing so they can identify things that they can do differently or better. And once you're reached at that very high level, now you're actually able to kind of see things that other people wouldn't even be able to kind of see that you're still working on in order to improve and then even increase your performance beyond your already exceptional level of performance. And across your many years of studying expert performers, do expert performers ever really come out and say that their improvement was easy? I... I have uh, had the chance you know, of being on a couple of panels with Olympic medal winners and musicians and chess players, and I've yet to find anybody who, once I've given a talk describing, who wouldn't sort of recognize this process, this incremental improvement, and this kind of continuous commitment that once you practice, you're going to do it with full concentration, 
because otherwise you're wasting your time. I guess that's one of those hard things, you know, in science. I can tell you I've never encountered anybody, but I can't prove that somebody won't basically appear here and basically be now the counterexample that I didn't know about. However, I would say that I've now been researching this for 30 years, and I probably encountered some 50 cases where people initially claimed that this was an exception. But by looking more closely at the evidence, I've been able to at least construct what I think is a plausible explanation that's based more on this continuous practice, even though the practice may not have been, you know, observed by a lot of people who thought that it sort of occurred spontaneously. You know, there's been many, I think I think many is a fair word, many books that have been in popular culture that have been inspired or influenced uh, by some of your work. I think some of those popular work would be Malcolm Gladwell's work. And there's a couple issues in his work that I would love for you to address. I think one right off the bat is that uh, it has become really ingrained into society. And I, I'm sure I've been guilty of it too, because it's so easy just to say, hey, you become an expert at 10,000 hours. And what, I, I would love for you to address that and then maybe even use the example of the Beatles and perhaps some of the misguided, uh, misguided uh, thoughts about how the Beatles actually got to be the Beatles. I, I think what our research that we did on uh, a music academy in Berlin showed that the most talented or the ones that the, the music teacher viewed had the highest probability of succeeding uh, as violinists, they were also the ones that reported having spent more time basically practicing by themselves. And, and we argue that this is very effective when you have a teacher telling you exactly what you need to do, and then you go ahead and do it. And if you do more of that, it's likely that you will actually uh, you know, be able to get better. We reported that those academy students, when they were 20, had on the average uh, practice for 10,000 hours, which is a pretty amazing, huge number. And I guess Gladwell, you know, was struck by this. Uh, so he came up with a rule that was a little oversimplified. He said that in order to achieve international level of performance, uh, you need to have basically spent 10,000 hours. And, and he pointed to the Beatles as a group that played a lot of music in Hamburg, Germany, during uh, before they became famous. The issue that I would have with uh, his statement is that this really nothing that I know that makes it magical 10,000 hours. The estimates that I see for winning piano competitions would require these individuals to have spent more like 25,000 hours uh, to win. And there are other skills where it seems like you can actually be world class in less than 1,000 hours of uh, basically deliberate practice. So if we go back to Beatles, you know, they spent a lot of time playing, and, and, and we actually went to some of the biographies of the Beatles, and they didn't play more than maybe around 1,500 hours in Hamburg, although, you know, they said they were playing pretty much, you know, 10, 12 hours a day. I guess what, what I would argue is a kind of even more important thing, that just playing in front of an audience the only thing that that seems to be able to improve to me would be their ability to play as a band. And the Beatles were really mostly famous for their ability to compose no music and then perform that music. How to explain now how they got to be better composers would make me look now for activities that were more directly related here to improving their composing ability Again here, you need a lot of practice, and we basically totally agree with Gladwell about that, but there's no magical boundaries. And maybe as you were pointing out, some people who just count the number of hours they've been doing things, you know, like driving, 
doesn't make them an expert just because they've done 10,000 hours of that activity. The key thing is to spend a lot of time where you're really trying to improve specific aspects. And if you can actually sustain that amount of training for thousands of hours, evidence shows that you're going to be uh, likely to be exceptional. And if you can keep pushing that, you may end up you know, being world class. You know, Malcolm Gladwell brought up another issue that I, I thought was perfectly reasonable and made sense to me as a guy who had a late birthday for sports. I was a baseball player until my first year at college. But I think about his example, I believe it was NHL players, uh, professional hockey players, and he talked about the birth date issue. Perhaps you could uh, outline a little bit about the, the birth date issue. Did Malcolm Gladwell get it all right in the long run when it comes to the, uh, the birth date issue? I, I think that, and, and, and I, th- I find it very interesting, uh, because if you're a coach and you're actually trying uh, to pick out the most talented kids, it would be make sense here that you're actually picking out the ones who are performing a little bit better. And what people found was that if you analyzed those who were actually succeeding and actually reaching uh, the very highest levels, that they have are much more likely to be born kind of and be the oldest people in this age cohort that are practicing together as uh, children and, uh, and adolescents. So I think that is basically uh, correct. Now, what people have pointed out is that these effects are not, you know, incredible except for certain types of very extreme situations where you're looking at 13-year-olds who were the best in soccer in England were essentially, uh, there was really nobody born in the latter half of the year. So most of them were this part of this cohort that were the oldest uh, among the soccer players that had been playing together. You know, I think one of the things that's really fascinating about this work, your work is the motivational aspect. I mean, I get very motivated reading the book because you can't help but you just look at the you look at the research, you look at the data, you look at the stories, you look at the examples and you say to yourself, "Wow, I can do anything if I really want to do something." But motivation's a tricky thing, and I just watched a movie the other day. I don't know if you've seen it. It's called Whiplash. Uh, it's about a jazz drummer and a very demanding teacher that pushes this young guy. And the young guy basically cracks at several points in time. He doesn't make it. But basically, at the end of the movie, the young guy accepts the instruction. He he has the the social motivation. He has the push wherever it comes from exactly. Maybe it was the teacher, but he finally gets it. Something clicks. And why don't you speak to social motivation? Because I look at myself. I was very motivated by, you know, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be on the script that everyone else was on. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to to go down my own path. And that motivated me to find success. And I can think of, without trying to, to bore you with all the details, but I can think of innumerable uh, dead ends that, that were stopped. And I'm sure a lot of people would just quit and give up and go back to the day job at that point in time. But I just always felt like, don't stop, don't stop, no quit, can't quit. And there's something, in whether, in whether we're talking about uh, uh, extraordinary performers or the corporate world, because your work translates to the corporate world as well. Uh, the I can't attitude is is a real, as you describe, a real red flag, isn't it? Yeah, and and I think uh, I was struck by how convenient this idea of basically claiming that you can't or that you lack the talent, because in some ways, if you looked at learning, say, a foreign language, I've encountered a lot of people who say that they can't do that. Essentially, what that means is that they're not going to put in any energy, because why would they uh, if they're basically just going to waste it? But it's interesting, and I actually encountered one uh, colleague of mine who fell in love with basically a woman who only spoke Spanish. He was part of this group who had real difficulties learning languages. He was sufficiently motivated, so he was quite successful here in mastering Spanish because he had a concrete sort of reason. And also, I think, in some ways, when you're 
basically interacting with another individual, it's, it's a pretty uh, good learning environment where you get immediate feedback about whether they understand you or not. And I also think that it's interesting when it comes to music teachers. A lot of teachers, basically, it's convenient to basically tell some student here that they lack talent because they're not willing and able to make progress. So it almost takes away the responsibility of the teacher to actually help the student get the motivation that they need in order to progress. And once we look here at motivation as something that teachers, especially good teachers, are able to instill in their students, then I think it changes a little bit how we look on education. And similarly, if we can convince students that they actually, if they are able not to find the right kind of training that actually will help them improve, that that will, you know, give them motivation and confidence that they can actually succeed. Because it is sort of a magical paradox that if you don't believe that basically you're going to get any better, it may be very difficult to motivate yourself to put in the practice. And basically that belief that you're not going to get better almost needs to be changed before it really makes sense for the teachers and the students to invest in this you know, gradual progress of getting better. And, and I also think that having good metrics so the student can really see how they're getting better is really key because just sort of doing things and not getting that immediate feedback that we, you know, see is an essential component of deliberate practice, you don't really have a sense that you're getting better. And that, you know, may just confirm your sense here that it's a waste of time. You know, as you talk about getting better, I'm thinking of an example, and I want to kind of combine some things, but I'm thinking about comedians. I'm thinking about guys like uh, Jerry Seinfeld, uh, Jay Leno, Gary Shandling, people that put immense hours on stage in small comedy clubs in their early 20s, and then 20, 30 years later, uh, they, they become some of the biggest celebrities out there. I think what's really interesting about comedians, and you talk about this with chess grandmasters, but chess grandmasters will go about studying their predecessors. They will they will find and look at the games of those that have come before them. I think comedians are very interesting about that, where it seems like comedians are always very willing and able to talk about who came before them. And there seems to be a tremendous amount of studying uh, as well in comedy. I, I'm not necessarily sure it's a direct uh, connection between the very different domains. But why don't you speak to the idea of, of studying your predecessors? Many people like to imagine I must invent it out of whole cloth. I must come up with it on my own. But, you know, look, there's been a lot of people before us that have done really well. And you've seen in your work that those expert performers, they look at the experts before them, don't they? Yeah. And, and I think that gets to, you know, this effective learning. And we see in all sorts of domains where, you know, like, for example, mathematics, the claim was in the, I guess, uh, uh, 14th century that it would take a lifetime here to understand math. And, and basically, this was referring now to mathematics that you pretty much, if you're an advanced uh, student in high school, you basically have mastered this because in the 14th century, they basically had to rediscover it for themselves. And now, basically, you can actually get that information from uh, math teachers and basically math curricula. And the same thing in music. The level that people are playing today is vastly superior to what they were doing in the 19th century, even. And, and these historical changes are directly a result here of actually younger individuals finding teachers who will be able to fast-track them uh, to learn things in the correct way such that they get closer now to the frontier, uh, basically where they're now going beyond what any current living musicians have done in order to create that unique uh, contribution. And, and I have to say that virtually all of the major creative individuals I mean, for example, Mozart 
his father had him copy music pieces by other composers as a way of learning the structure of, uh, of making music compositions. Picasso, you know, he was uh, excelling in the more traditional forms of, you know, drawing uh, natural scenes, and he was basically acquiring the techniques that then allowed him to basically now redirect them towards doing things that hadn't been done before. But the technical background of being able to actually make what he was seeing in his mind's eye, that was techniques that he had acquired, you know, as a very, uh, as an adolescent. So, so I think people are afraid that they're somehow going to erase their unique contribution. I see more that you need the tools so you would be able to actually be able to realize whatever uh, contribution that you are going to be making. And, and being afraid to hear that, you know, learning these tools will somehow remove any originality, I don't find very good evidence for that. I want to shift into something slightly different for a second in, in this whole topic area of your work. But I, I love the example because as a guy that used to play baseball and, and now I practice a lot of yoga, but as a, as a right-handed hitter, I know that I have a big difference between my, my right and my left hip. And I, I can imagine after doing that for 12, 13 years, the, you know, there, there's just differences. You, you do that much hitting and you lean all your weight on your, your right leg, uh, something changes. I think one of the most fantastic examples to really give people a flavor for deliberate practice and what can happen physically to changes is that a, a, a great tennis player like Roger Federer, so much practice at such a young age, it's not just the muscles and the arm that holds the racket that's changing. It's the actual bones, isn't it? It's really far-reaching, the kind of changes that you can uh, observe. And and if we're talking about bones, we, we know that height really can't be changed by training. But the thickness of the bones uh, actually is influenced by training. And, and, and it's pretty clear what the mechanism is. So in your arm that you're hitting the you know, the tennis ball with, that creates vibrations in the bones that then actually uh, releases chemicals that now stimulate bone growth. So if you take x-rays of uh, tennis players, the arm that they are holding the tennis racket has much thicker bones than their left uh, arm. But if we look at other activities, I guess when it comes to muscles and, and, and even, especially if we look at endurance athletes, the whole heart actually is restructured uh, to maximize now the pumping capacity of, of the heart. So even the arteries are growing to allow for more blood with oxygen to circulate, and, and we also see more capillaries surrounding those muscles that need a lot of oxygen to be able to sustain you know, running or, or swimming or whatever the endurance activity is. It's just quite amazing that, you know, not only can deliberate practice uh, develop a skill, increase a skill, it's, it's changing the structure of the mind, the brain, it's changing the body. It's quite amazing what we as human beings can do with practice. It's just, it's, I sound too excited probably, but it's, it's just, it's really motivating when you, when you, and you've dedicated your life to studying this. And I, 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 you know, look, I've not read everything that you have done in your career, but if you spend many, many decades doing this, it's going to be up to other people to come along and say, well, Anders got all this wrong. That's going to be a tough challenge, isn't it? Again, here, I guess I'm doing my best to try to keep up with developments and, genetics and uh, other domains here to see, you know, are there any relevant evidence? And, and what I think is quite interesting in genetics, you know, people believed here that once we were able to describe the DNA, that we would find these differences in genes between elite athletes and uh, basically other, you know, people who didn't have any sort of obvious genetic problems. 
but that research has really kind of uh, not uncovered any sort of individual genes that somehow would explain why some individuals are basically performing so much better than other individuals. Personally, I think there's pretty interesting evidence here that training history of these individuals uh, provides a much better uh, explanation here for the individual differences that we see. And, 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 and even if we take something like the outstanding performance of Kenyan runners, when you basically look at the kind of training history that they have uh, and the benefits of training at a high altitude as very young children and being forced to basically run long distances to school every day and doing so in a very hilly countryside would seem to, you know, provide some interesting ideas here about uh, what actually may contribute to differences uh, that we see in performance. A lot of people have talked about those particular runners with the uh, the barefoot running playing a role as well. Exactly. And I think that's very interesting that, that, that basically once you start looking at what sets apart uh, the very best runners from somewhat less uh, successful runners, it is sort of the efficiency of their running. Uh, so basically their ability to run without basically using up more kind of energy and oxygen. So they somehow have been able to sort of come up here with training that allows them to maximize the effectiveness of the whole bodily system as opposed to, you know, some kind of specific unique thing that would be a more plausible target here for a single gene that could create a difference. I want to relay a little story and I want to let you comment on this. So years ago, uh, and I've had him on my podcast, but years ago I had a chance in person to interview Vernon Smith and Vernon Smith shared the Nobel prize with Daniel Kahneman. Uh, you know, they each were going down that behavioral work. When I went to interview Vernon Smith, it was at his office. Uh, then he was at George Mason university. For those of you that might not know, Vernon Smith uh, has Asperger's. And so a lot of people out there will say, hey, but what about some of these savants, you know, a guy like Vernon Smith? And I thought it was really interesting when I went to interview him, it was his his college office and we were setting up cameras, lights and everything. And I said, well, you know, Dr. Smith, uh, you know, we're going to kind of bug you here and uh, you're going to be making a lot of noise, setting, setting everything up. And he looked at me and he just said, I will never hear you. And it was such an interesting comment. You know, here's a man who's won the Nobel Prize. He has Asperger's, and but an intense focus. And so, and I wanted. You know, and six months after that, I was at the offices of one of the uh, the most successful hedge fund managers in the world, and we were actually chatting in the bathroom. And I mentioned to him that I had just seen Vernon Smith, and we started talking about Asperger's. And he said, "Oh yeah." We've got a ton of guys that work with us at our firm that have Asperger's because these guys can focus like no tomorrow. Why don't you talk about, though, because there's some people out there listening. They might say, well, Mike and, uh, you know, Professor Vernon Smith, he, he, he's got this, this, this unique advantage, but it still comes down to the practice. He's got the ability to focus. But t- talk about, why don't you address that issue when people have talked about savants and perhaps uh, uh, guys that guys and gals that might have uh, well, a perceived advantage being on the autistic scale or spectrum? Now, now, I have to say that I have not personally done any research uh, on, on, on the issue here of, of, of uh, Asperger's and, and uh basically uh, these kinds of syndromes. But I agree with you that all I know, and I've basically been working now with numerous uh, expert performers, that when you put them into the lab, you know, one of the things that is so amazing is how they more or less kind of start out being relaxed and then as we get closer here to the actual test phase, how they actually become completely focused. And they basically are able to sustain that. And I, I don't know, and I think that would be interesting research, whether there are individual differences in how able people are of actually getting into that a state of full concentration. But, but to me, that is one of the prerequisites 
for actually being able to stretch yourself is that you actually put all your attention and resources on actually improving whatever aspect that you've picked out. And I would argue that basically when I talk to these individuals, they sort of tell me how important it is for them to get enough sleep. So basically that, that idea here is that in order to be able to exhibit full concentration for maybe three or four hours a day, you need to have a lot of time for relaxation and recuperation. And that bounds here about basically, and, and maybe there are people, I've yet to find anybody who seems to be able to kind of concentrate for you know, five hours every day for years, there seems to be sort of that upper limit of around four or five hours that people actually can. And and, and the ones that we have the best data on are, are authors who basically go off somewhere where they have no other responsibilities, but still they only seem to be writing for about, you know, four or five hours in the morning and then use the rest of the day to sort of more or less recuperate uh, so they would be able to wake up refreshed and then get in another four or five hours here of very productive writing. And, and I've talked to surgeons and other individuals who basically are quite aware of, of that issue here of, of balancing that level of full concentration with uh, recuperation. And, and, uh, and if you want to basically maximize how much you're putting in, and, and getting out of writing, you like to kind of keep on a pretty stable daily schedule. And I don't know if, if you have any experience relevant to how some of these very successful individuals uh, organize their day uh, to maximize their ability here to, when they are concentrating, you know, to really maximize uh, the outcome. Well, having... Having written five books myself, I, I can. It's really interesting. We we're talking about focus. Is that you? You you're right. You can only stay focused for a certain amount of time. I think the interesting thing for me for focus is when those moments happen inside intense focus that you enter the flow state, and you can talk about this some. But when you enter that flow state, time can stand still. Time just goes away. At least in my experience, it just. It disappears and you can just, you could just, maybe you, you don't achieve a huge volume of work, but the, the quality and the, the precision that you can sometimes find in a flow state, it's, it's quite addicting to get there. I, I think this is very interesting and, and something that I, I guess I've commented on a couple of times and even had a chance to talk to Chick Sent Me High about a lot of people refer to flow as kind of highly enjoyable, but I think several people have pointed out that if you reflect on being in a flow state, you're no longer in it. So it's almost like you can only kind of know that you were in a flow state afterwards. <laughs> exactly. 100%. <laughs> right. And, 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 and basically, I think uh, some people have even viewed here the flow state as actually being kind of this totally relaxed state where you're more or less just playing, you know, so like if you were to dance and just do exactly what occurred to you, that that's a flow state where you're not really trying to impose some constraint on what you're doing. And I would argue that the flow state that you were referring to, when you're really focused and you're actually engaged in doing something, is more like you're so focused in it that time you're not not longer aware of the time that you're investing. So it's almost once you're kind of getting out of it, hopefully sometimes because you really feel that you've reached the end state of something that you were trying to work on, that's when you get the sense here of how time more or less just disappeared. But that those two different states here, the kind of the playful enjoying when somebody is going down skiing and just having the sense here of total effortlessness is a different kind of phenomenon than the one where you have that, you know, sustained focus and where time just disappears. Usually I know it's time to come out of those types of states, either one of two things, I'm hungry or I need to use the bathroom. 
It's, <laughs> it's you. It's you. It's you're serious. It's really because otherwise, when you're in that moment, you don't know. Uh, I would love to talk about uh, the the notion of solo and in group because I wonder. Not even I wonder, but I know there's a there's a talk about the notion of of deliberate practice from a solo perspective, meaning that this is this is deliberate practice is difficult. It's hard. It's going to take a lot of effort, but it's it's not something you really you really don't do it with a team, do you? I, I think that given that you're really trying to improve some aspect of your own performance, that basically makes it. To optimize the benefits of deliberate practice, you have to be in control of your own training. Uh, and I often sort of mention this example with playing doubles in tennis and you miss maybe a backhand volley. And then the game just kind of continues. You get another opportunity maybe, you know, 30 minutes later, and you're not going to do that any better. So if you compare that now to uh, a training situation where you have full concentration and available resources, like a coach. So the coach will now give you basically a backhand volley that's really easy, and you're standing up by the net, and then basically as you're perfecting uh, basically your control over this, it becomes increasingly more difficult because now, you know, he's placing the volleys in a more difficult way, and eventually you have to move away from the net, and then, you know, the end point is that you're, rallying and then he's including sort of a, a backhand volley within the rally. One or two hours of working with a coach like that, I believe is going to improve your backhand volley so much more than maybe a year or two of just regular uh, practicing with your uh, friends, uh, basically playing games. As I think about your career, so here you've spent a lifetime studying expert performers but you have had to, your career has also been about deliberate practice. You have been in the deliberate practice of studying deliberate practice. Why don't you talk about some of the changes and the growth that's taking place in yourself to the extent that you can or want to? I'm really curious because this is true. You, you have, you've also, I mean, anyone that has a, a very focused direction in life, there's a lot of deliberate practice. Talk about some of the changes you think you've seen yourself over your career. That is uh, some interesting questions, and, and I think I would point to a couple of sort of uh, important events. When I started my career, you know, I was, like most people, really consumed and, and sort of spending a lot of, as, as much time as I could on all the various activities ranging from teaching to doing research and doing all sorts of things. Then I got the opportunity to go to Max Planck, and this is where we did the research on the uh, uh, violinists at the Music Academy. Uh, and that position was a little bit different. I didn't have any teaching. I had a lot of free time. And I think that was the first time I realized that I could put in more hours working hard than I could really profitably uh, get benefit from. So this kind of that sense here of that there was a maximum. So in order to really write, it was better for me to kind of set aside three or four hours of writing and then basically, you know, have other activities that would be less demanding it was a much better way and made me feel much better than uh, basically this idea here of trying to, you know, get every minute in doing various things because as a, when I was... Uh, regular academic professor at University of Colorado, you know, there were, basically I didn't have any free time, so I didn't really have control over my time. And I think that kind of idea here that that you need to sort of take control over your time and also maybe even say no to uh, activities uh, so you can basically make sure here that it's aligned here with your priority here in terms of what you really want to put in your best hours on. And and I've talked to a lot of people since that period, and they found that to be a very, very useful idea. And, and I think for people to set aside maybe one or two hours for writing or for thinking about big projects or something, but basically having those hours scheduled, uh, I think uh, has made a big difference to a, a number of people that... I've had this discussion with. 
And I think when it comes to issues here relating to doing science, I would argue that deliberate practice, at least in a very generalized way, that really corresponds to seeking out uh, people who disagree with you. And I, and I found that, you know, some people in, 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 in research, you know, don't like to be criticized and, and get annoyed. I've tried, you know, basically to establish uh, dialogues with people who, you know, basically have different views. And I find, similar to the deliberate practice, instead of doing things that, you know, I've done and, and talking to people who agree with me, uh, trying to convince people who don't agree with me uh, often generates a lot of references to new stuff that I didn't know about. And by understanding maybe people who disagree with me better, I can do a better job here describing what I think is a compelling evidence. Uh, so, so that's kind of on a very general level. And, and I guess I remember one time, again here, that it was sort of a, a sense of satisfaction when, because you submit manuscripts and then you get reviews. Uh, and at one point I really felt that now I can actually anticipate, you know, what the reviewers are going to say. Early on, I kind of got surprised by what they were thinking and what they were commenting on. I, I sort of, it was a sense here of self-confidence when I felt like I could kind of anticipate what they were going to be concerned about. And, you know, and sometimes uh, you can disagree here about how compelling certain kinds of evidence is, but at least if you understand where other people are coming from, uh, you're more likely, I think, to be successful than if you don't understand here, you know, why they're uh, basically upset about certain things. You've talked to a lot of different athletes and, and probably professional organizations. I, I think you had some involvement with the Philadelphia Eagles a couple years ago. And I can think back, and you mentioned this example in your book. You talk about Jamarcus Russell. For those of the, for those of you that might recall, was a very large a phenomenal quarterback at Louisiana State University. He left college as a junior. He was the first pick in the draft, and he flamed out. It just didn't make it. And then you look at a guy like Tom Brady with the New England Patriots. I don't really need to say anything, but I think he was pick 199. So my question, is it clearly we have not – figured out a way yet. And and those people in these very, uh, look, I mean, the professional sports is big business. They've not yet figured out how to uh, project who is going to put in the deliberate practice or have some teams figure that out. Yeah, I think this is really interesting. And, and, and I guess I've had several chances here to kind of describe my view here that that some of the best football players are also the ones that are, have the deeper understanding of the game. So I remember when I visited the Eagles, uh, I had a chance here to talk to several of the players and, 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 and coaches, and they were actually recommending some players that they felt, you know, were really standing out. And I was kind of compelled here by hearing their history of how they, you know, from early on, kind of got responsible for kind of figuring out what other people on the team were doing and, and what the opposing team. So they really, you know, early on started out having a very refined description of what was going on in the game. And I think that then gave them that ability here to assess here what was going on and also what it is that they needed to do to be able to, you know, uh, behave in the most effective way. For some reason, I think that it's so commercialized in the uh, National Football League that it's hard to get, you know, help a coach doing this because they have too many things and too many things going on. But it would be wonderful, you know, if, if a coach was interested in, in investing resources and, and I think that would involve very much kind of helping individual players, you know, uh, develop. But once you have a whole team, I think it's very hard to find the time and the resources where you actually will be able to help players. And 
some people may even say here, well, by the time you get to NFL, you know, that's basically when you should have learned these things uh, already. So maybe, you know, college or, or high school might actually be sort of a better place to to start uh, introduce uh, these ideas and, and maybe, you know, you would find people who are even more motivated here by trying to find a way here to uh, develop uh, more effectively. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because I had a conversation, a text conversation with a friend of mine who played professional baseball for a dozen years, and he now coaches uh, high school athletes in the state of Florida. Many of these high school athletes that he coaches goes on, go on to play at uh, places like FSU and play professionally. And I told him, I said, hey, you've, you've got to pick this book up because your, your book, uh, Professor, because I said it, it's so motivating. And if you can, I would have loved to some, for someone to have told me the insights in this work when I was a very serious baseball player at the age of 15, because you, you get caught up in other things and then perhaps maybe you practice really hard and you get to a certain level, but then you... You, you plateau and you don't necessarily know you're plateauing, but if you, if you would have, if you would have had the insight of the deliberate practice, you can, it, especially if one has the motivation, you can, you can see that plateau more clearly and then perhaps push through it. So I think it's a fantastic way to think for young athletes in particular. Yeah. And, and the part that I really like is, that once you have a sort of a richer description of what you're doing, it now becomes much more interesting. And so it's sort of like as you get better in your understanding of yourself and basically the game environment, every game becomes more interesting because you have a more refined way of actually analyzing it. And then once you have the experience, you can go back and identify things that you can improve. And, and actually, that satisfaction of identifying things that you can improve and basically have the sense here that it's almost like you're kind of reaching over a sort of a, a peak of something so you can actually see beyond things that you didn't even, weren't able, able to conceive of. And I think that sort of psychological richness, uh, I think comes very closely along with this idea of representations and your ability here now to kind of evaluate your own performance and then use that as sort of direction for your own training and how you can then actually see how you're getting better. That that rich sort of sense, uh, when I talk to some athletes, you know, they are kind of just doing what they're doing. Uh, they're not able to kind of have that appreciation of what's possible. And I think that getting that appreciation might actually make it much more interesting for them and thereby, you know, enhancing all sorts of things uh, related to the activity they're involved in. And clearly, this, I, from my perspective, the, the work that you've put together is not uh, age dependent. So I think I could have very easily got the same, maybe not exactly the same, I'm in my 40s now, but I could have I could have really benefited from this type of understanding at a younger age. Let me ask one kind of little follow-up question to this, though. But for some of the the child, uh, I don't want to say prodigy, but after they've gone through deliberate practice at a very young age, perhaps we can call them prodigies. Some of the the youngsters that you've studied, do they start to have this? When do they start to have this self appreciation versus? You know, they're involved in deliberate practice, but they might not necessarily see the entire big picture. Well, and, and I think that is a finding that is sort of interesting with respect to prodigies is that a number of music prodigies don't have successful adult careers. Hmm. And, and some people have argued that if, if the parent is really taking over all the control here of the training, you're really not training somebody who is now going to be able to have their own representations and be able to internalize more and more of the training so that when they reach kind of uh, late adolescence and early adulthood, that they actually can go on by themselves and go beyond basically what the teacher uh, was or the parent uh, was basically uh, uh, helping them do. So, so I think that kind of idea here of, 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 allowing the child, you know, to be sort of a, 
as, as Paul, uh, Leslie Polgar said, be a co-author here in, in basically the process of developing your own performance is really critical. And, and I think that the more that you can sort of listen to the child and make sure here that, you know, they are understanding and in some ways building up these representations that allow them to take over more and more. And I think that generates self-confidence, but it's also critical uh, in order to kind of go beyond so to keep moving ahead, you really need to have mastered and internalized all the things that you have acquired. Well, you know, I could keep asking questions all day. I appreciate the time today. Is there is there anything that I did not bring up today that you might want to elaborate on? Anything that's near and dear to you that you're thinking about right now and all the papers and books that are on your desk are focused on on something? Or do you, do you feel like we've covered the covered the ground pretty good today? Well, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed talking to you. And I guess what I would say is if you find that when you're looking here at the material that there are some questions that, you know, you would like to, uh, you know, ask again because of the way that uh, I kind of answered them or whatever, I, I'm, I'm just willing to basically help you because I find that the way the questions that you're asking, uh, they deserve the best possible answer. And, uh, and sometimes when you're trying to think as you're answering questions, it, it doesn't come out as smoothly as maybe uh, would be uh, ideal. I want you to tell the website where people can go, if, if, whether it's your, your FSU website or a different one. But the book is called Peak, Secrets from the New Science of Expertise. Uh, and that's written with your co-author, Robert Poole. Meantime, everybody can easily find you on your Florida State University website. It's been a few years since I've been in Tallahassee. It's actually been, my gosh, I think it's almost been, I want to say 20 years since I've been to Tallahassee. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's even more than 20. <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> yes. It's been so enjoyable here. So where are you located? I'm in, uh, I'm talking to you from Saigon today, Saigon, Vietnam. Wow. Okay, so, yeah. so but, but you're living in the States normally? Well, I was living in the States about three years ago, and then I started this podcast in 2012 after my fourth book. Then I got hired to do a speaking tour in Asia, and it was supposed to be a three or four month speaking tour for banks and hedge funds. At the end of that, I was living in San Diego. At the end of that, I said, well, I really don't want to go back to the States right now. So I stayed. Wow. I guess sounds to me that somebody should interview you. <laughs> well, it's a, you know, it's a kind of a crazy story, right? I mean, there's, look, you, you've talked to a lot of people. Everyone's got a crazy story, right? There's always a, uh, an interesting Well, idea. I think that's one of the things people who are very successful, I found consistently, are the most interesting and, and, and sort of people that I love interacting with. I, I view that as sort of one of the lucky aspects of my career choice is that I've been talking to really wonderful people. Yeah, it's, that is true. And I think people will see that when they read your book is it it's really a, a phenomenal intersection. I think, you know, look, people love sports in America and you've just had a, a really great insight to talk to so many different people. And look, the great thing about this, if I can just keep beating this drum, is that whether you whatever you might want to do, even if it's later in life, you've pointed out that people say they might want to run a marathon at 80 years of age. You, you know, you might not compete in the Olympics, but you can drastically improve yourself at almost any stage of the game, can't you? And that's that's just motivating. Right. And, and I think basically, you know, that idea of, of the journey that, that just doing it up, uh, but once you start looking at the experience of actually making the improvements and stuff like that, it's almost, you know, that you get that excitement that some people get from climbing mountains. Uh, but here, you know, it's something that you can do even if you live in the middle of the city because most of the things are really happening in your own mind. And, 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 and I think that kind of excitement, uh, if, if I could contribute to providing people Seeing that as an opportunity to, you know, enrich their lives, I think that would be, uh, that would make me very happy. Well, it's, it's loud and clear in this book, which is, there's no excuses. 
if you want to do it, you can do it. You just got to you've got to buckle down and 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 learn learn some about deliberate practice. Most anything is achievable. Congratulations, really, really. I, people are going to know that. I mean, look, I've done a lot of podcast episodes, and people are going to know that I really enjoy this book. So, I appreciate your time today, Professor. Oh, it was my pleasure. Maybe one of these days we'll run into each other, and I certainly uh, would would look forward to that. Well, thank you very much. I I, I will maybe have to swing through Tallahassee the next time I'm in the states. <laughs> well, just uh, let me know here, and I'll I'll make a real effort here to make sure that I can meet you. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Okay, thank you. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.